When it came time for the Black Swan Net on the 28th of August 2022, I was ready. I made the call as net control, and all I heard was static. There was a radio blackout. What is a radio blackout, and how can we communicate during a radio blackout? That's what we'll cover today on Radio KD8TTE. Stick around. Black Swan, Black Swan. Quite simply, radio blackout is a condition that occurs when there is no usable frequency between two stations that want to communicate. How can that be? On episode 58, we talked about how resilient high-frequency HF communication can be, shooting the signal straight up and having it refract back down from the ionosphere directly. It gives us good coverage for short to medium distance. There are some times that it does not work, however, and the 28th of August was just such a time. As I was preparing for the net organizing messages to release, I got some news that I was not thrilled to see. X-ray flux was impacting us on flux capacitor, but what? In case you didn't see episode 58, here's some fundamental concepts that we work with in HF radio. Between 30 and 600 miles above the Earth is a layer of the atmosphere that has charged particles, the ionosphere. The ionosphere interacts with radio waves. There are, at night, two layers. The F layer, up high, and the E layer, down closer to the Earth. As night conditions turn into day conditions, the F layer will separate. A F2 layer will appear up high, F1 is lower to the Earth. Below F1 is the E layer. Also during the day, a new layer, layer D, will show up closer to the Earth than layer E. If you want to send a signal really far around the world, we send the signal out close to the horizon so that it will travel furthest over the Earth's surface, and then we will use a frequency that will pass through the D layer, through the E layer, through the F1 layer, and then hit the F2 layer when it refracts back down to Earth. We can use that technique to talk all around the world but we are skipping over much of the surface that we have shot the signal over. It's just going to miss it completely. If we want to have good connections to everybody nearby, then we can shoot the signal straight back up and pick a frequency that will refract back down. That's usually going to be at the F1 layer. So what's the trick? Well, the trick is that there is the D layer during the day, and that can absorb the signals that we are sending up and that somebody else is trying to hear. Generally speaking, the lower the frequency, the more that the D layer is going to absorb the signal. Now, the black swan net that I was trying to operate works specifically to communicate within the state of Ohio. That means that we use NVIS, Near Vertical Incident Skywave Propagation, sending the signal straight up, having it come right back down. We operate between 3.5 and 7 megahertz, depending on the time of day and some of the conditions that we're dealing with with space weather. Let's go back to the alert that I got. The alert was from NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center. It indicated that the X-ray flux exceeded a particular threshold, M5 is what it was indicating. What that would mean is that there would be on the sunlit side of the Earth the potential for radio blackout, that is for HF signals not being able to make it because they would be absorbed at that D layer. The Space Weather Prediction Center has some really good imagery for us to take a look at. It's going to show us in this particular image the highest frequency that's affected by absorption that's taking place in the ionosphere. We can see throughout the day how the part that is affected is moving from east to west because that is the part of the Earth that is facing the sun. And as we approach the period of time just before the start of the black swan net, things get really crazy. The Black Swan Net is scheduled to start at 1700 UTC and on this particular day, just about 45 minutes before that, 
a huge area lit up and got really red. Let's take a look and see exactly what that means. All right, so we focus on the image that is showing us what's happening at 1619 UTC or 1619 Zulu. That's about 40 minutes before the start of the Black Swan Net. This is the point where the ionosphere has become incredibly excited and absorption is taking place at uh, a much higher uh, rate than normal. If you look on the right side, you're able to see where it shows attenuation. That's the maximum absorption. And down on the y-axis, that is along the side there, it's going to show the frequency that we're dealing with in megahertz. And then how far over that line goes, the histogram goes to the right, is going to show how much attenuation there is. That's measured in decibels. The critical thing that you can see is that at 3 megahertz, which is that top red bar that has the greatest level, that's actually topped out, showing 35 decibels of attenuation. That's a tremendous amount. And so even at 4 megahertz, it's somewhere between 25 and 30 decibels of attenuation. 5 megahertz has 20 decibels of attenuation and so on. So there's a lot of signal that is being absorbed tremendously at those lower frequencies. If you notice as you go higher and higher into the spectrum that is going to say lower and lower on that y-axis there, the higher frequencies, you can see that there is less attenuation. That is the clue for how we're going to be able to work through these kinds of bad conditions. So what I was doing to try to establish the net is I was making the call at the designated frequency at 5 megahertz. But when I didn't get a response back five minutes in, I switched up to our 7 megahertz frequency and tried the call again. I didn't hear anything, and after five more minutes, I went back down to 5 megahertz. The reason I didn't keep going up is because if I keep going further and further up in frequency, my signal is going to go further and further up into the ionosphere. So when it refracts back, it's going to be shooting over the antennas of the stations that want to work in this particular net. All right, so if we want to know what's going on, one of the things that we can do is tune into a station that's got some high power that is going to give us some sense of what's going on if it is working on several different frequencies. Fortunately, both the United States and Canada have such stations. WWV and Canada's CHU will do the same thing. So when I've got this kind of condition going on, I might just switch over since I'm trying to work at 5 megahertz and I just want to see what's happening at 5 megahertz, what's happening at 10 megahertz. Or I can just work methodically through the whole thing just to see can I hear any signal there. We can go to WWV at 2.5 megahertz and see what do we hear. From there, we can move up a little bit and go to 3.33 megahertz and that's where Canada's CHU will be operating. Moving a little further up to 5 megahertz, we are still listening for a signal from Colorado into Ohio. And what do we hear? A little further up, back to Canada, 7.85 megahertz. And are we able to hear anything there? Well, that's kind of promising. And when we're talking about making the connection into Ohio, that's good. We've got something that's happening there. The bad news is that's further away from the stations that I'm trying to reach. So I know that if I'm going to be able to get a signal, I've got to work below 7 megahertz. With some persistence and using some more resilient digital modes with a much narrower emission, uh, I was able to make contact with two of the Black Swan stations, but we were not able to establish a circuit that was really workable. We were not able to move any messages directly. The fact that we were able to exchange call signs, however, was very helpful. Part of the PACE plan that we have, that is to say primary, alternate, contingency, and emergency, the four layers that we have in place for being able to work the stations that we need in the black swan net that includes not just working on HF directly we also have stations able to use the winlink system 
Windlink is a global network of radio stations that have the ability to connect with your computer that is connected to the radio to be able to exchange messages. What that means is that if you are not able to make contact with a station that is nearby because that signal is being absorbed, you can make contact to a very far away Windlink station to be able to make your message get picked up there and allow for Windlink to do the work. Now, of course, you can do the same thing if you have another cooperating station in a faraway place, but who's able to have that kind of a schedule established? Such things can exist, and it requires that you set up that infrastructure. In this case, we happen to use Winlink because that infrastructure is already set up. I was able to make contact with Winlink using the RDOP transport to N5TW in Texas. I was able to unload all of the messages that I needed. I had specific messages that needed to get to stations that were on the air that particular day. And because I was able to exchange call signs, I was able to send those messages to those stations. I was also able to pick up messages that were coming in to me because stations that were not able to reach me, either because of the signal was just too poor or because they weren't able to be in the net at that particular time, had sent me WinLink messages earlier. Like we talked about in episode 58, we can use HF to create highly resilient circuits. However, it's not magic. There are conditions under which those signals will be absorbed and we're not able to make the connections as expected. When we have a pace plan, we're going to have options for being able to make sure that the message that we need to send will be able to get through. Whether you coordinate with stations that are far away, having a schedule where you're able to talk to one another, you're able to provide relay service for one another, or you are able to use an automated system like WinLink, you can put these pieces together to ensure that your emergency communication system is going to work, whether it is simply going to be talking station to station or working by relay because you need a higher frequency and a longer distance to punch through that pesky D layer. I hope you enjoyed this and share the video, like it if you found it to be helpful, subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss any of our stuff. This is Radio KD8TTE, 